well-informed person, you know, like I'm not dumb, but I had no idea you could do any of this. Uh, this talk is about secure multi-party computing in the cloud, also known as the CC project, uh, and these lovely folks, Ataturk, Mayank Varia, Arul Singh, yes, uh, are gonna come talk to you about all of that. Um, the possibilities for this expand to things like we can start doing actual st statistics across medical data that we can't share. I mean, it's really amazing. All right, so without further ado, out of Turk. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. What? I can't hear you. Um, uh, so I'll talk about uh, C2D, our uh, privacy preserving scientific data analytics environment framework that we are building on an open cloud. And this is a collaboration between the Massachusetts Open Cloud, the sale team of uh, Harari Institute of the Boston University, uh, the Dataverse team at Harvard, and, the, uh, and Red Hat. My name is Atat Cherk. I'm a research scientist at MOC, and, and I'm going to be presenting together with my Kwaria, uh, Ben Getchell, and, and Parul Singh. Um, so I'm going to start the talk with talking about some of our use cases. Uh, so that you understand what, we are, what kind of problems we are trying to solve. And these use cases are literally the use cases that are coming to us for addressing in, in our own platform. The first use case is companies in Massachusetts want to compute average salary differences across gender, ethnicity, and different groups uh, within the state. But they want to do it while not exposing the average salary of any company, any individual company or any individual group uh, within a single company. So they want to keep their private data private, but they want to have the aggregate average. A similar use case, again, from the Boston area is tier, tier one trauma centers in Boston. They want to generate aggregate reports about cases they service without revealing any patient data. They are governed by very heavy regulations. They are not allowed to share data with each other but they want to be able to say, for example, how many trauma cases they serviced during the Boston Marathon bombing. So uh, another use case we have currently within, again, in the Boston region is researchers in hospitals uh, want to generate aggregate statistics about rare diseases that they, they, they care, they cure, uh, across multiple hospitals. They have uh, so many few cases of these rare diseases that they cannot do generalizations that they want to do. So they want to have more examples across different hospitals, but because of regulations like HIPAA, they cannot uh, share this data with each other. And they want to be able to do this uh, aggregation, this statistical analysis, without uh, revealing any patient data. Similarly, companies or organizations want to be Run, want to run data analytics jobs in the public cloud, especially uh, for, for, for data analytics jobs that require more uh, computing resources than they currently have in their private data centers. But they do not simply trust to a single cloud vendor. So they are looking for jobs where they could um, divide their data, partition their, their data uh, into multiple clouds and run their analytics across multiple clouds without re revealing any one particular cloud any meaningful data. So the sharded data that they have will not make any sense to any public cloud, even if it get the public cloud decides to go behind their back and look at their data, they won't lose any critical information. The, the assumption is those multiple public clouds will not collude and uh, combine the sharded data into a single data. So, so those kind of use cases are the cases that we are trying to address in this framework that we are building. So this, uh, this framework depends on multiple uh, tools out there available and also uh, an infrastructure as a service solution, which is uh, the one that uh, Massachusetts Open Cloud is providing. And the MOC is very important in this aspect because it allows uh, different parties to own their trusted enclaves within, uh, within, uh, within a single public cloud uh, without needing to trust the public cloud provider. So MOC's role in here is, is practically that. Uh, we are using Dataverse as our uh, data set repository solution because Dataverse is one of the well-established Dataverse uh, data set repository solutions out there, open source data set repository solutions out there. And it hosts a lot of, uh, a significant number of 
scientific data sets, especially in the social sciences area. And we are using Conclave as our multi-party computation framework backend uh, to provide privacy-preserving uh, scientific data analysis. Um, I will briefly talk about these components. Massachusetts Open Cloud, hopefully some of you know, uh, is a very, very unique entity. It's a collaboration between academia, the government, and the industry, which you do not see often, right? And the, the most important uh, aspect of MOC that you make use of in this framework is MOC tries to disrupt a single vendor cloud model. We want to offer a multi-vendor cloud model. And what this means is within a single data center, you will have multiple cloud offerings uh, that you can mix and match and create your own cloud from those offerings. That's what MOC is trying to enable. And it, also MOC is not trying to do this in an academic setting. We are really trying to do this in a real uh, data center uh, on a production scale public solution. Um, uh, so we, ha we are operating over a 15 megawatt data center in, in Western Massachusetts in Holyoke. Our, our cloud solution is mostly backed by OpenStack and OpenShare. Uh, Dataverse uh, is an open source software platform for building data repositories. And it provides incentives to share data. Uh, and also it provides mechanisms for controlling the access to, to the data sets uploaded there. <laughs> And it, it has a very large community. It's a well-established software. It has been in development for the last 10 years. And especially for social science data, chances are if you have a paper in science, your data set will be available in, in, in Dataverse. So it's, it's installed in more than 20 repositories worldwide. And I, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, Dataverse installment, the Harvard Dataverse repository, for example, hosts more than 70,000 social science data sets. So these are data sets that researchers have uh, published papers and utilized these data sets or created these data sets and uh, decided to upload these data sets to Dataverse so that other researchers can download and use them. MOC and Dataverse is now in collaboration to build a new software that we call Cloud Dataverse that not only allows you to download these data sets, but also enables you to compute over these data sets. So Cloud Dataverse extends Dataverse to support much, much larger data sets than that are mostly available in social sciences. We achieve this by storing the data sets in, in, in object stores. In our case, this is Swift backed by, uh, backed by Ceph. And we add a compute button next to each data set so that you don't have to download these data sets. You can do on-site computation. Uh, whoa. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ben Getchel. I'm a software engineer at the Software Application Innovation Lab here at the U. Uh, I'm going to talk about Conflict for a second. Um, so there's a bit of background. MPC allows a group of individuals to compute you know, aggregate functions over sets of data without revealing any of that data to one another. Um, so they can more or less compute over it like um, as though we're in the clear, but nobody, but nobody um, reveals anything that they want to. Um, so it's a really powerful protocol, but it's difficult to implement because um, most existing frameworks either require um, domain-specific languages or knowledge of uh, cryptography, which is hard for people without knowledge of cryptography to do. Um, Conclave is different because it uh, interprets SQL-like statements and automatically generates and dispatches code from MPC backends. Um, so you don't need to understand MPC in order to use it. Um, so uh, as an example, if you wanted to perform an aggregation over a bunch of uh, individual data, a bunch of log files, um, you could either just do one large aggregation, concatenate all the data and aggregate it, or you could uh, locally pre-compute an aggregation using some distributed backend like Spark or something like that, and then just submit the, the count to an MPC computation. Here we go. Um, so Concrave integrates seamlessly with uh, existing infrastructure. And, um, and supports a pluggable backend structure. So you don't, uh, like if you want to integrate some new framework for MPC that just came out, you can do so with, with relatively little ease. So we've, uh, we've described to you the three different types of technologies uh, that are involved. In oh. I don't know. Yeah, so we've, we've just, 
Is this good? Yeah. So we've described the three different types of uh, technologies that are involved in our project, Conclave, Dataverse, and the MOC. And I want to describe to you now uh, why we are trying to combine them together and why we think it's such a powerful combination. So first, I want to describe the integration of Conclave and Dataverse. So Conclave is a technology that allows you, in principle, to protect any kind of computing over any kind of data. In theory, it can allow you to perform anything securely so that nobody knows uh, uh, to compute over data that one cannot read. Uh, but Dataverse is where the data actually live. It has tens of thousands of data sets that are already indexed and curated and available for use. And so the idea is to make it so that all of that data is available for the research community to analyze, to try to extend, to try to uh, reproduce results, et cetera, all without even needing any real uh, uh, involvement by the owners of that data on Dataverse. Uh, indeed, the owners benefit from having their data be more available and more re reusable. Um, uh, and conversely, Dataverse has an extensive access control mechanism that allows us, when, uh, when we produce new data products as a result of any kind of secure analysis over existing data, any newly derived data products can also be stored back within the Dataverse repository and tagged appropriately, and it gets good, strong access controls from it. Uh, second, uh, the integration of Conclave within the MOC. These are two very natural things to play nicely together because they're both built upon the same kind of principle. The idea that you want to federate trust rather than centralizing it. The idea being that you don't want to have to have uh, people who use the cloud or people who do analytics to have to trust jointly any single computer or any single organization to hold their data. Uh, instead, they can sort of uh, they can they can on the fly choose uh, uh, where they want to trust or even not have to trust any individual entity, but instead know that just a collection of one out of n organizations uh, is doing a good job of protecting their information. Uh, furthermore, uh, in addition to sort of their compatibility from a trust point of view, they're also very uh, synergistic from a, from a performance point of view. Uh, secure multi-party computation as an idea that we've described and also Andre in the keynote, uh, it tends to be very network-bound and in particular latency-bound. Uh, and uh, whereas, you know, the internet uh, is designed for sort of high bandwidth uh, communication, uh, it's not so great from a latency standpoint. And so putting all of the work to do secure multi-party computation within the MOC, within a single data center, really helps us out from a performance point of view. Uh, and so bringing all of these three pieces together, we think, introduces something really powerful, where basically, uh, you know, right now, nowadays in the world we live in, the hope is if, you jet, if you're a data scientist and you do some sort of research and you gather a data set, your hope is that you did one large amount of effort to gather a bunch of data so that then the whole rest of the world can benefit from it. But usually due to security and privacy concerns, that's not the case. You end up siloing your data, you end up isolating it, and anybody else who wants to do something of a similar nature has to go reproduce the information over again. Uh, so, so with this sort of uh, uh, combination of services, we believe that we've designed a system so that uh, when somebody uh, makes a data set, uh, creates a data set, they can make it available without making it readable so that other people can analyze data that they cannot even see and that that way your data, your effort that, that came into to providing and, and curating, et cetera, a data set gets huge value throughout the entire community. So there are a variety of examples of this, many of which Atta described on the first slide. Let me just sort of give you a notional conceptual overview of one of them, the application to medicine. So we can think about, uh, in this example, uh, there's two hospitals, Boston Children's Hospital and Mass General Hospital. And you know, let's think about some of the in immense data sets that they have. And it would, wouldn't it be great if the information that they had about, say, patient outcomes or anything else uh, were made available to a larger group of medical researchers to really see any kinds of correlations or, or anything that they can find about sort of what can produce better health outcomes. Um, but of course, this data is very, very sensitive for a variety of reasons. <laughs> So uh, these hospitals don't just make it readily available for the entire research community to view. Uh, so using sort of the way we envision our workflow going, uh, and, and Perul will next describe in more detail how this works uh, in depth, but sort of at a, at a notional level, the idea would be that these hospitals could then put their data in the Massachusetts open cloud, but, uh, but always encrypted using just standard cryptography uh, uh, protections, uh, and make it uh, and, and, and register it within Dataverse so that the knowledge of the data set's existence is public knowledge and available so that people know that these data sets exist, even if they cannot read them. 
Uh, and then suppose there's a medical researcher who wants to do some sort of joint analysis. So like Atta was describing earlier, say maybe they want to analyze some sort of rare disease where neither hospital individually, no single employee at any of the hospitals has enough data to make uh, enough understanding of what's going on with this rare disease. But together, maybe there's uh, over two or three or more hospitals, there's enough data to, to do some sort of uh, sophisticated analysis. The way that it would work in our system is that the researcher would submit some sort of query. You can think of it as a SQL query or something like this uh, that then would get uh, transformed using into this cryptographic uh, system in, uh, using Conclave into this way uh, to compute this uh, uh, system privately so that uh, basically, uh, does this work? Yeah, so that uh, even though the data sets, the, the raw data from the individual hospitals lives on different machines and they never share the data with each other's machines, that uh, collectively they can do some sort of uh, communication between these two machines to send information that looks like gobbledygook. It doesn't look like they're sharing any actual data, but somehow in this process, following this cryptographic procedure that Conclave enables, it would allow the uh, researcher to get somehow uh, the result of the, 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 the SQL query or the analysis that, um, that the, the researcher wanted, all without, um, without any of the sensitive data ever leaving the, the, the pods uh, that the hospitals chose to entrust with their data. And furthermore, not only could this uh, result of the analytic be useful to the researcher who actually submitted the query, it could actually furthermore get pushed back into, up into Dataverse with whatever access permissions were derived from the original, whatever the original owners of the data would have wanted for their derived data products, so that even in addition to the original researcher who made the query, anybody else could, uh, could benefit from the results, anybody else can consistent with the wishes of the owners could benefit from the results of that as well. Hello everyone, my name is Parul Singh, I'm a graduate student at Northeastern and I'm working on MOC as a research assistant. I would be explaining how we implemented C2D framework on MOC. Uh, our choice was to run C2D on containers, and we needed a container orchestrating platform, so we moved with OpenShift and Kubernetes because it gives the powerful job framework, and it also gives the capability to manage Slack resources on MOC. Right now, we have a single OpenShift cluster with multiple projects and parties, but down the line, we are planning to integrate trusted elastic infrastructure to build trusted, secure, bare metal enclaves for parties. C2D framework runs on OpenShift, which is on top of MOC. The Conclave web is the app through which the user interacts with the C2D framework. And for each party, we would have an OpenShift project. When a user submits a workflow, Conclave web generates uh, an organization pod with all the Kubernetes components, like the Conclave container, which have the backend as well. We use a config map to load the protocol and the input data and config. The reason we use for config map is like we want to segregate or we want to decouple the configuration artifact from the image. And we use empty dirt, which is a scratch space on the pod to get data from Swift and also to store the intermediate results. This is how a single organization pod would look like, but for multi-party computation to happen, we need more than one pod. So each organization will have their own pod on OpenShift environment. Definitely, they would need to interact to each other because MPC computation needs to interact between two organizations, and we do that using the service exposed on each of the pod. Once a computation is done, the result is stored on Swift, which is an object store, and the analyst can use the result from the Swift. Uh, ben is going to talk about a video demonstration of how the C2D framework works. Okay, so all of our codes are uh, hosted publicly on GitHub under the organization of that name. But uh, we also made a short demo video for conference. This one is oh, you already got one open. Okay. Well, let's do that then. Here we go. Oh, it's already 1.5. Nice. That's great. Okay, so we have a command line tool um, that we made so developers can launch jobs on here, but we also threw together a web UI, I mean, this is the OpenShift web UI, but so if you look on the side there, on the right there, there's the protocol that the, the analyst would have written up on their computer, which is just like a short Python file. Um, in the top right corner, uh, there's two data sets stored on Swift that I just have into there. It's called in one and in two.csv. 
Um, then we go to UI. You can um, enter in. I'll fast forward until you're there. Where are we at? So you enter in the Swift endpoint, the container name, and uh, the data sets that you want to compute over. Upload your protocol and hit compute. And then in the OpenShift dashboard, you see there's a, a server which is handling the, so GIF is the MPC backend being used in this comp computation. Um, and it handles all MPC traffic, which is all encrypted using public key encryption, so that it, it can't know anything about what's being passed through it. Um, these pods are just waiting to start for them to start up. But once they start up, they will perform that protocol. So it looks like they started up and finished. And then we check on Swift, and the output data set open.csv is stored there. And that is it. I'll go back to the. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, this is the next one. Oh, thanks. Questions? If you have questions for uh, for the team, I'll bring you a mic. When, when you do the analysis, what is to prevent the analysis being constructed in a way that kind of inherently exposes uh, sensitive data? I can, I can take it. Oh, sure. So, so by, by its nature, the system doesn't uh, control that. We are building a policy mechanism, but the idea is the data owners have data tags and algo tags associated with each data set that identifies what kind of computations can be computed over the data set itself. So if the data owner allows a computation which eventually reveals that they, any information that they didn't, did not want uh, exposed, uh, this system by its nature is not controlling that. It's only making sure that if all the, even if all the data that is exchanged across different parties uh, uh, is exposed, somebody gets that data, still uh, no, no information is uh, revealed, even or even if one party, yeah, I think that's it. Oh, sorry. Just because I had the same question he did, so I just want to make sure I understand the answer. So if I'm the researcher and I craft a malicious query, there is not a safeguard, but the safeguard prevents third parties like AWS or the cloud hoster from putting that data together. So as the researcher, I could, as a third party observing packets on the wire, I could not. Um, so so there's, there's not yet a, 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 a protection. The, the policy piece is a work in progress. It does not exist in the software at the moment, uh, but it will. And the idea is, as Atta said, that when the uh, uh, data owners specify, uh, like provide their data sets, they will, once we build this part, they will specify a policy for how their data may be used. And then when a researcher submits an analytic, if it's not compatible with the wishes of what the owner specified, uh, then it would be rejected. So then, like, the point is that the, the data owners would not be willing to allow their data to be used uh, to be contributed towards an analysis that they were not okay with. You can imagine that part of this uh, will be, like, partially mechanized. Ahead of time, they could prescribe uh, the, uh, the, the kinds of analytics they're comfortable with. And also, there could be a method that if it's something that... Uh, is not already in the white list of what the policy prescribes, that also the owners could sort of manually override and allow things that were not initially part of the, the set. So, so some things that are decided ahead of time, and then for sort of things that uh, might have been rejected ahead of time, then the, the data owners could go approve it later if they wanted. But it's not there yet. That's our plan for the next year. Oh, okay, just a quick clarification. If a person writes a query that only one, that will only pull out one individual within a data set, would it be set as a, could it be set as a policy so that the owner of the data set says, any query using this data must have at least five individuals? Would that be an example of a policy? 
Uh, sure, uh, but uh, it would probably be, so, so first of all, anything that would pull out subsets of the data set, no matter how large or small, would presumably be forbidden by most people. The idea would be to do things that are sort of information lossy metrics, things like finding aggregate trends or, or analysis over time, like a time series thing or something like this, that isn't about pulling out individual data from within any of the uh, data owners' uh, data sets, but about analyzing trends between them. Uh, and one could specify not just that it would involve a large fraction of your own data set, but that it also must involve you know, a large number of other people's data sets in conjunction with your own, i.e. you may not even want people to see trends over just your own data, but also together with others. So how re receptive have companies like, you know, Mass General Hospital and Children's Hospital been to, to, to this uh, new paradigm here? And um, what is the uptake? Uh, yes, so um, we are in talks with the tier one uh, trauma centers, Mass General Hospital, Boston Children's Hospital, in using this framework. Boston Children's Hospital is very much interested in it. Um, tier one uh, trauma centers are also very much interested in it. They actually, uh, um, tier one hospitals, tier one trauma centers request is one of the driving forces of this building this framework. In general, how, in general, how is the community of businesses uh, overall adopting this or accepting this? What what is your biggest uh, hur hurdle? Uh, an, an implementation of NPC by the sale team is in use by the businesses of uh, uh, Massachusetts. Um, maybe, Maya, do you want to talk about it? Sure. So, uh, so secure multi-party computation, this cryptographic technology generally is in use by a lot of uh, entities throughout the city and state. There's a lot of folks in the room right now uh, who work in sale uh, who could tell you more about it than me. But for instance, the pay equity project that Atta described at the very beginning is an actual thing that the city of Boston used uh, to calculate uh, overall pay disparity between men and women throughout the city without learning individual in information about payrolls at any individual employer. Uh, they collected data for a about one sixth of the, the greater Boston workforce uh, using this. Um, uh, there are other applications of this in use by the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, uh, et cetera. So uh, generally speaking, the, the, the secure multi-party computation stuff, we at BU have done a lot to, to try to generate interest of that within the business community. This specific talk, though, this specific conclave system and the integration with Dataverse, so far we've mostly just done the discussions with the, the medical community that Atta described. So I've got um, two questions. Um, so, uh, so what are the operations supported by this, by your MPC? For example, addition or multiplication or whatever. Um, so second question is, uh, do you just use the regular MPC or the MPC with uh, our cheater tolerance? Sorry, what was the second question? MPC is what? So with cheater tolerance, meaning that if uh, one of or a few of the data uploaders are dishonest in the computation. Okay, yeah, good questions. Um, so the, the, the first question is uh, the conclave system, uh, okay, so maybe to both of the questions. The conclave system itself uh, can integrate with any uh, backend that does secure multi-party computation in principle that you want. I mean, there's a few number of them that have actually been programmed in thus far, but in principle, so, so, so what conclave does is it takes any existing piece of software that does cryptographically secure computing, and it uh, sort of lifts it so that uh, input programs can be specified. So you don't even have to specify it at the level of addition or multiplication to your question. It was uh, that you specify it as sort of a SQL-like query. Uh, so, so you specify an uh, analytic, and then it gets translated into any existing MPC engine. To your second question, the different MPC engines that we have integrated in the background have different kinds of trust profiles. In general, they're sort of honest majority systems, so you need half of the machines at the moment to be honest. Uh, but, uh, but the system is pluggable. You can extend it, uh, connect it to other ones as well. That's just the stuff that we've like operationally connected it to from a software point of view at the moment. But, but that's not a rigid choice, I'm saying, like, you could do other things. Yeah, uh, so I apologize, I'm not very familiar with um, the uh, 
uh, multi-party communications. Uh, maybe there was an earlier talk that I missed. Um, but it sounded like in response to one of the earlier questions that basically each you know, individual provider, for example, like Harvard or MGH, um, you know, they're the only ones able to decrypt their data, but the operations that you can perform on that is basically like, you know, they have a, a, a given set of operations they allow you to perform. Um, and you had said earlier that the encryption, like the encrypted data was just standard, you know, n standard encryption algorithms. Um, so I'm curious if this is using any kind of like fancy homo homomorphic encryption or anything like that, or if it's really just, you know, restricting which aggregate operations um, people can perform on that and, and allowing each individual organization to define which aggregate algorithms they allow people to perform on their data. And then you, so then your like conclave or musketeer um, backend then is able to, um, knows how to combine those aggregate, aggregate operations across the different data providers. Is that eff effectively how it works? Uh, so, so sort of uh, to, to the first part of your question, um, it's kind of neither of the two things you said. It's not just like encrypted data plus, you know, just some sort of whitelist of, of operations, nor is it the full power of something called fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, it's something in the middle. Um, and uh, if you want to think of it as if it were fully homomorphic encryption, it's, that's the style of the guarantee that we achieve. Um, but we do it a little bit differently than what literally the term fully homomorphic encryption is, which um, fully homomorphic encryption tends to be computationally intensive, but non-interactive. You don't have to do much in the way of communication between the parties. Multi-party computation is the other way. It's not nearly as computationally burdensome, but it involves a lot of communication between parties. So basically, all of the parties locally store encrypted versions of the information, but also they have to do work between them in order to understand the trends in between the different parties' data sets. Uh, and that communication involves, it's not encrypted data, but you can think of it as that. If that helps, it's some sort of encoding of the information that allows you to compute the actual you know, SQL query that you want, but without actually learning anything other than the answer to the SQL query. So the work that they do while trying to process the query together, these machines are trying to process the results of the query together, because it's a query over all of their data. Uh, and so while they're trying to process this data, they send encoded information information of a particular type that is uh, of a type that facilitates actually doing the an analysis, but that uh, does not any allow anyone to view any of the intermediate state while the analysis is being done. And somehow, kind of magically, through the way that the crypto works, uh, the, the answer falls, like the output of the query falls out of the system in the clear, but, uh, but without any of the other like byproducts while computing that being available for use. I don't know if that answered your question. Other questions? Um, can you explain how the protocol works to share like the encrypted data? Uh, sure. Sorry, we're trying to find the slides that show that. Um, <laughs> Would you have that? In it was in the kickoff. Oh, in the kickoff. It's like way down. In the kickoff. Past that. Yeah, there. Twenty seconds. Um, okay. Uh, do you want to cover this? So um, yeah, sure, I'll give a simple example of, of how to do this thing called secure multi-party computation. Uh, for this example, it will just cover, suppose there are three participants, the green, blue, and red parties, and all they want to compute is the sum of their three numbers. Okay, it's like a super simple analytic. Uh, it can get uh, more complicated than this, of course, but you know, just to, to keep things simple, all they want to do is they want to compute the sum of their three numbers. And so I've sort of visually depicted the numbers. Think of like the size of this green box is like, the actual number x, 
uh, like, like the length of it is actually the, the, the number itself. Uh, and so the way that they do this, okay, so they want to compute the sum of their three numbers, but nobody is willing to share their number with anybody else, right? That's the point. Uh, so what they do is locally on their own computers, they split their number into three pieces. So part of this green party, party X, uh, splits their number into three different numbers uh, that have nothing to do with X, modulo the fact that the, the sum of these three numbers actually equals X, okay? So, so think like this is visually like X1 plus X2 plus X3 is X, but otherwise the three numbers individually mean nothing. Uh, and the other parties did the exact same thing. Uh, and then what they do is basically they share one out of three, you know, each of these three tiny things like X1, X2, X3. They give one of these things to each of the parties. So X1 gives, you know, part, the green party gives X1 to itself. It doesn't go anywhere. The second piece goes to the blue party. And the third piece goes to the red party. So they've just shared numbers that have nothing to do with their actual secret number, right? Like they're, they, they, they're just, you know, useless junk. Uh, and uh, so this is sort of my picture that like just from seeing one of these pieces, uh, you have no idea how big the actual X was, right? It could be like a little bit bigger, it could be a lot bigger. Um, but this number could even be negative, so it could actually be that like X is smaller than X3, whatever. Uh, limitation of the picture. Um, and so everybody does the same thing. So everybody sort of receives as part of this like one piece from each of the other participants, right? Um, with the property that remember the sum of the three green pieces really was X, the sum of the blue pieces really was uh, Y, the sum of the red pieces really was Z, which means that the sum of all nine of these pieces really is still the answer we're looking for, even though no individual person has learned anything in this process about what anybody else's number was. Um, they can sort of uh, locally now each participant can just take the sum of the three numbers they received, right? So now this person has one number here, this person has one number here, this person has one number here, and the sum of those three numbers is the sum of X, Y, and Z, even though they like they themselves have nothing to do with X, Y, and Z. And now let's say, suppose that the green party was supposed to learn the answer, let's, I don't know, just because, uh, then everybody could just simply give to the green party like whatever the sum of these numbers were, like not the individual pieces, but just the sum uh, and like the sum here and so like the sum of these three pieces is the answer to the question but in the process uh, nobody has learned anybody else's information this is what I meant by sort of an encoding of X is sort of splitting X into these pieces and sending these pieces off to these other parties Note that to do this addition, we did a decent amount of networking, right? We sent all these like little encoded pieces to the other participants. This is why I said at the beginning that of my part that um, that this process is very network bound, and why doing it inside of a co-located inside of a single data center is useful. Yes. So my question was how this works for non-commutative operations. Um, uh, right, so, so uh, okay, uh, so, so differently, I, I, I don't I don't have a short answer to that, unfortunately. Um, uh, differently, like, like uh, the, the, the basic principle I want to argue is the same in the sense of you come up with a way of encoding the information such that the encoding, uh, so, so the key properties of this were, were not the commutativity, I argue, of the operation, but the fact that there was an encoding of the system that was conducive to performing the computation, but this encoding, any individual's piece of the encoding was not conducive to learning the information. Those were the operative pieces. The commutativity made addition quite simple, I agree, and other operations are going to be less less good from a performance point of view. Uh, but uh, but those were the operative pieces, and I claim you can do this for other operations as well. Claim without proof. So quickly, here only one party needed to know the final answer. In a situation where all three parties need to know the final answer, it would be you would start from scratch again with different numbers or... Um, Distribute the same number. It, it depends on the assumptions you're making about these three parties. Uh, so, for what uh, it depends on if you're concerned about the parties from a confidentiality point or all, only, or also from an integrity point of view. So, if you're concerned about the three parties learning it more information than they should, but you're not concerned with them messing with the state of the computation, uh, if if you trust them from an integrity point of view, uh, then once one person learns the answer, they could simply tell the other people. If you're trusting them for that, right? So, so for what the what I've shown on the slide is all that I have shown is how to make sure that nobody learns anybody else's sensitive input. 
Uh, if I, I mean, with this picture that I've shown, if somebody wants to mess with the computation in the middle, right? Like if the if the blue party wants to make sure that like I don't get the right answer, it could simply not have sent me the correct answer. Like like there's nothing in what I have shown that would protect against people who are cheating and violating the terms of the protocol. One can do this too. Uh, the actual conclave software does not, but it is it is definitely possible, and there's a lot of research in multi-party computation that does also protect against integrity, that basically along the way people would prove to the other participants in the system that they're doing things correctly. It is possible to do that, but right now we are not. Uh, we're only trying to protect against confidentiality, in which case the answer to your question is simple, that once this person learns the answer, it just tells the other two. Okay, um, so say you would just have two parties, right? And then the computation you're doing is you're calculating the mean of certain categories or something um, between the two parties. Right. So then the result, um, like if you see the result and you're not a member of either the, let's say they're adversarial to each other, so they don't want either to know the other one's data. So then um, if, if you're not a member of either of those, then you don't know the data from either one of them. But if you have the data from one of them, then you can, you can uh, infer the data from the other one based on the result, right? So right. that's, isn't that a limitation? Or? Yep, so the, uh, this is what Atta was saying in an earlier question, which is that uh, secure multi-party computation does not protect anything from, uh, I'll call what you described sort of an inference problem, that taking the sum, so this is why my example is the sum of three numbers, you figured out why we did three. If we had done two, this whole thing would be kind of useless because if you know your own answer and you know the sum of the two, then you know what the other person's answer is. So uh, this, this, this uh, encoding mechanism is about protecting the intermediate information in the process of going from the input Outputs to the outputs. It is not about ensuring that the outputs are safe to reveal. That has nothing to do with this process. That is an independent question, and that's what Atta was describing earlier, that one thing we want to add on top of this in the next year of the, pro of the program is a policy mechanism so that the owners of data sets could prescribe ahead of time which are the kinds of, com uh, which kinds of computing would they be uh, 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 willing to allow their data sets to, to, to be used inside of. That has nothing to do with this. This is about sort of protecting how to get the answer to the analytic without revealing other information, not what analytic you would want to have computed in the first place. We're, we're over time, but we can take one more question because now we have a short break. No? All right, let's just have a big round of applause for these guys. This is awesome.